Hi Rockets, it's me again, Miss Power, and I am here to go over week 17. Oh, it's a little bit backwards, but week 17, which is all about primary sources from Oklahoma's past. So we did a lot of talking about Oklahoma's past. We talked about the settlers that came, Dust Bowl. Uh, before that, we talked about how Native Americans were uh, relocated from the southeastern states to the Midwest region. So we've done a lot of investigating into the past. So we're kind of switching gears a little bit this week and just revisiting all those different things that we've talked about this year. All right, so the first thing, I'll share my screen with you as I normally do. All right. The first thing though, before we start, I've got something pretty neat and that, that I want to share with you that I just learned about. All right. So somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, a man named Forrest Flynn has left, or Forrest Finn, I'm sorry, has left a treasure. The treasure map is not the type of map you would think of that we've talked about in third grade. The treasure map for Forrest Finn's treasure is a poem. Only Mr. Finn knows where this treasure is, but many people all over the world are cracking the clues in his poem, hoping to find his treasure. Interested? Let's take a look at this article. So the link to this article is right here in this slide. And I clicked it and it's going to bring me here. Um, you can listen to this article or you can read it. It's a five minute listen, so, but this is a true story. This is Forrest Finn, and he really does have treasure buried in the Rocky Mountains. And people have been trying to crack this poem, but no one has found the treasure yet. So, I don't know, I took a look at it, and it was pretty tricky. Maybe you'll be the one that cracks the code and finds the treasure, who knows? So, <clears throat> Let me go back to this for a second. One thing that's really important in this week's Social Studies Weekly uh, newspaper is primary sources. And a primary source is just something that directs relately to what it's about. So it has a direct connection. So this article that I just showed you, this would not be a primary source. This would be a secondary source because it's about the poem that they that uh, you can use to crack the code and find the treasure. However, if we were to go to the actual poem, here's a piece of it, if we were to go to the actual poem, the actual poem itself would be a primary source to find the treasure. Okay, so we're going to keep talking about that as we go through this newsletter this week. Okay. All right, so there are a couple of different people that are involved in understanding the past and the present. Um, if archaeologist and anthropologist. Archaeologist, you may have heard before, you can see an archaeologist right here. She's digging up some bones. Archaeologists seek to understand people or animals of the past and what they made, used, and left behind. So maybe tools that they used, uh, homes that they built, and they want to understand um, their culture of the time and more about them. Anthropologists, this is an anthropologist right here, anthropologists compare different human cultures and communities from the past and the present. So they look at how uh, people uh, and communities were based, if they were small families or really large families, or if they traveled or if they stayed in one place what kind of language they used, what all those different aspects of culture, songs, dance, books, writing. She's investigating a wall with writing on it, so she's probably learning about how they communicated with writing. So those are two types of scientists that deal with people of the past and how they lived. So in this, is this archeologist, these bones that she's uncovering, would that be a primary source or a secondary source of discovery? That would be a primary source. And so would this. This writing on this wall would be a primary source because it is directly related to these people that she's learning about. 
All right, so we're going to be looking at some different artifacts. And before we go into the, um, before I show you what the artifacts are, I want you to have this question in the back of your mind. What do all of these artifacts have in common? Okay, why do you think I'm showing you these things? Notice if you can think of a pattern or some type of connection between all of these different primary sources or artifacts, okay? All right. Whoa. I'll just go to, okay, I don't like this. I'm gonna go to this one. Here we go. This is better. All right, so I'm gonna show you this quick one minute video really quick. George Caitlin fue un pintor estadounidense conocido sobre todo por su retratos de indios americanos. A partir del año 1830, Caitlin viajó a través de las llanuras del oeste del país pintando a los indios americanos. Sorry, here it is in English. George Kaplan was an American painter known mostly for his portraits of American Indians. Beginning in 1830, Kaplan traveled the American West painting Plains Indians in their own territory. Kaplan was concerned that American Indians would not survive and painted them because he felt their lives should be remembered. He also became something of an activist, lobbying U.S. leaders for their rights. He had an Indian gallery that included over 600 paintings and 700 sketches. Catlin went bankrupt trying to sell his paintings and other Indian artifacts. He wanted the U.S. government to purchase them, but they were not interested. Instead, a rich man named Joseph Harrison Jr. received the paintings after paying off all Catlin's creditors. They sat in a boiler room for many years. After Harrison died, his wife gave over 500 of Catlin's paintings to the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. It is not known what Catlin's true motivations were. Some people believe Catlin was motivated by money and attention. Others think he was truly concerned for the welfare of the American Indians. Whatever he was, his work has provided an important, lasting window into the lives of American Plains tribes. Okay, so that artist, George Catlin, he painted a lot of images of different tribes. If we wanted to um, analyze the source and Maybe analyze this painting. Okay, we would observe first what we see in this painting. So if I see Then I would reflect, if someone took this picture today, what might be different? What I see a photograph instead of a painting. Maybe they didn't really have photographs back then. And maybe his clothes were different. And then my third step would be to ask questions. So I already have a few questions. What tribe does he belong to? Where did he live? Why did George Catlin paint this man? Was he an important member of his tribe? So I wonder maybe if he was a chief or some sort of doctor or someone just very important to the tribe and that's why he has on this type of really fancy clothes. And then my last step would be to research, okay? And then I would just choose one of these questions 
and I would Google it and I would type in my notes here what I found. Maybe I found the answer to my question. Okay, but I'm not going to do that part right now so that I can save us some time. All right, the next primary source I want to show you is this picture that was also painted by George Catlin. All right, what do you notice about this picture? I noticed the title right here says ball players. So what could that tell us about these men? What do you think they're doing? Yeah, I think they're maybe playing some sort of sport that's part of their culture. It kind of looks familiar, but I can't think of what it looks like. Then we could write down what we noticed. We could ask questions. What are the rules of this game? What is this game called? And then we could research those questions and come up with more information on our own if we so chose. Right. Here's another primary source. This is a document called Memorial of the Cherokees, written in Cherokee and English. It was signed by both the Cherokee and English people. Do you remember who the Cherokee Indian was that came up with the with the um, the language? Uh, yeah. And that is going to be, I'm going to show you, and that is going to be in your social studies weekly. When you go through the articles, you will get to um, get a refresher on Sequoia and, and how he, um, and how his writing helped. Right here is a picture of Oklahoma Avenue and Guthrie. Hmm. Remember, we're trying to think of what all these things have in common. So we just had all sorts of things related to Native Americans, which we can find a connection with those. But now we have a picture of Oklahoma Avenue in Guthrie on May 10th, 1889. Do you remember any time this year that you and your class have talked about Guthrie, Oklahoma? Maybe during the land rush? Remember it started off as just a really tiny settlement and very quickly it grew, like almost overnight, they called it a bubble city. And we have Oklahoma Avenue again four years later. Look at that. Hmm. And then we have a picture of the Oklahoma land rush of 1889, another primary source. And then we have this picture, which was actually from our last episode of Social Studies, week 16, when we talked about the Dust Bowl. So these are the farming machines buried by the dust storms in the 1930s. That's what the caption here says. So what do you think all these pictures have in common? Do you think they tell a story about Oklahoma? Maybe they create a timeline? This happened in the 1930s. This happened in 1889. And then when we had the picture of Guthrie, we had four years later. I think that is true. I think these sort of form a timeline. Let me go to the... I think these form a timeline of Oklahoma's past. 1830, 1889, 1893, 1889, and 18, or 1930. So have you caught on to that? Great job. All right, so that is all that I wanted to show you for this week. The main focus this week is to refresh on Oklahoma's past and remember all those important events that shaped Oklahoma and uh, created the culture that we have today. So your job is to log into Social Studies Weekly and I'm going to show you how to do that one more time. So remember if you are on week 16 from earlier, you can click right here to get to week 17. So you can easily change the week. So say that you just finished week 16, you took the test, and you're ready to move on. Uh, you would just click this and go to week 17.
You read each of these artic articles, excuse me, or listen to them. You can speed them up or slow them down, whatever works for you. Go through each one, answer the questions. Okay, there's Sequoia and the pictures, some of these pictures from other primary sources. All right. Answer those questions, go all the way through, take the test, then bonus. You could do the crossword puzzle in the spelling game. All right, and then don't forget that there are some cool bonus sources and videos as well that you can access. So if you wanted to see more treasures from the past, you can click right here. And there is even more, there's so much in here that you could look at, some really cool artifacts. Okay, all right, let's see. I wanna make sure that I covered everything I needed to. Log in, read each of the articles, answer the questions. Crossword puzzling games are optional, yes. All right, so that is all I have for you this week. Once you have read the articles and answered the questions for weeks 16 and week 17 and taken the test for both, you are done with social studies for the week. So that is all you have to do. Of course, you can always go back and do the crossword puzzles if you want a little bit more or go back and look at those bonus sources if you're still interested in learning more. Thank you so much for listening. You've done a great job and I will see you next time. Bye.